introduce our keynote speaker, Jane Barton. Jane is the founder of Cardinal LLC, a consulting firm that provides educational programs and more to assist people in the challenges of aging, illnesses, and the grief that comes with the end of, end of life. Jane is passionate and experienced in the areas of caregiving, hospice, and palliative care, life transitions, and health. We're so lucky to have her here today, so let's give a big welcome to Jane Barton. So good morning. How are you doing? Are you ready to roll here? I just need to pull up one screen. And okay, we're gonna see if I can double click and get through this. So I wanna thank you so much for the opportunity to share a little bit of the journey with you today. And I was delighted when Jody called and invited me to participate in your programming. Now I know some of you, I've reconnected with some of you folks. I've been on virtual for the last three years. This is one of my first in-person programs. So I just wanna to stand to the side of the podium. I do own pants. <laughs> <laughs> now it was a big thing I had to put a note on my mirror this morning to say fully dress before you leave for the conference and I say that somewhat tongue-in-cheek but I'm actually being somewhat serious about it but I love this because the interaction the energy that's what makes it isn't it sharing stories and I was listening at the table that I'm seated at I was just listening to snippets of what had been going on in everyone's life and I'm just so honored to be here and hopefully to interact with each of you and get to know a little bit about your story so for today I want to extend my heartfelt thanks to the Parkinson's Association of the Rockies for the invitation and for the people that worked on the planning committee and for those of you that are new to me, just a little snippet about who I am and what I'm about, because I also tell stories, and it's important for you to know the roots of those stories. So obviously my name's Jane Barton, my company is Cardinal LLC, and I serve as an educational consultant, which means I get to do what I love every single day. I serve as a speaker, a writer, and or a listener, and I focus on the topics I'm passionate about aging, end-of-life care, and caregiving. Now, I have a background in hospice and palliative care that started in 2004. I served as a chaplain as well as an educator. I mean, if you're interested in the rest of my rather twisted career, you can read it in the bio, but um, I didn't arrive here in a straight line. I'll just honor that. <laughs> but of greater importance to our conversation today is my personal story. I was called to care when I was 15 years of age. My mom was diagnosed with terminal breast cancer. And as you might imagine, that has proven to be the formative event of my life. And for the eight and a half years that I cared for my mom and my family gathered around as well, I learned some very important lessons. And the primary one was this, knowledge is power. And when you lack knowledge about the journey or you don't have the resources, life can be pretty darn scary. And so every time I speak, every time I write, my mission is to share with you, the audience, something that will be of benefit to you, to fill in some of your gaps of information or perhaps enlighten you to a resource that could be beneficial for you and yours. And so that certainly is my mission today. I hope you hear something that will allow you from this day forward to make informed decisions instead of merely reacting out of fear in the midst of a crisis. So today we're gonna to talk about after the diagnosis, going the distance. Now I have to tell you that um, when I was listening to the people at my table, I realized I'm speaking to the choir here today. You have been tried and tested in the trenches of caregiving. And just know, I can't say I know exactly what you feel because I don't. But I know my own experience of caregiving for my mom, my dad, my brother, and also a handful of friends. So what I hope to do is, it may not be news to you what I'm gonna share, but sometimes just by naming it, it normalizes what you're going through. And you'll realize that you're not alone and that you don't need to blame or shame yourself for some of the feelings that may bubble up at 3 a.m. when you're just at the end of your rope. You'll understand that, hey, we all have our moments. And so I hope that we create a platform that's safe 
that's beneficial, that's collaborative, so that we can learn from each other by sharing a bit of the journey together. And so for our time today, our focus will be these four things. First, we're gonna recognize caregiving as a continuous process of change. And I know by many of the other programs I offer, if I ask people, do you love change? <laughs> it's not an enthusiastic yes. So that's one of the problems. That's one of the daunting challenges of this journey. We're gonna realize the diagnosis, although it's a personal challenge for the person receiving it, it's a family challenge because the consequences of that diagnosis ripples throughout the care system. Thirdly, we're going to explore the need for emotional agility to deal with all the emotions that we're gonna feel, not to run away from them or hide from them or stuff them, but learn how to work with them productively. And then finally, we're gonna consider how to live with change and uncertainty. And I'm gonna give you three different resources that have been beneficial to me, and some of them I've learned from caregivers in the trenches as well. So we have a lot of ground to cover, but hopefully I'll move through this, and if you have some questions, I'll address them. And if not, I'm gonna be here for the day with you. So just tag me in the bathroom, in the hall, at lunch, and I would love to consider continue that conversation with you. So let's begin by recognizing the obvious. The journey of life, well, it can and it probably has changed in an instant for you. We go along, we have a great plan, we have goals, we have dreams that we're moving toward and then something happens. We see a detour and all of a sudden we're headed in a direction we never imagined. Can you relate to that? <laughs> I'm sure you can. I know when I look back over my shoulder at my lived experience, I remember just such a moment, the moment when I was 15, when my dad came back from the hospital and he shared with me, with me the diagnosis of my mom. She had terminal breast cancer. And even though I was just a kid, I was only 15, I knew in that instant my life was forever changed. Before I heard that, I was still an adolescent. And in five seconds, I had been thrown into adulthood, and I assumed a large responsibility for my mom's care. I think every care partner can relate to that particular experience. Now, as a 65-year-old woman today, I look back on that time and how I wish I had learned to live with cancer instead of living in fear all the time. And I also wish I had known how to deal with change and adversity in a more proactive and more beneficial way. But at 15, I didn't have life experience. I didn't have anybody to process this change that had come over our family. We were just scurrying about trying to cover the bases and put out the fires that seemed to spark every single day. And so it was this constant battle and that is why I'm so passionate about this topic today. I want us to name what is going on. Now we may know it intuitively, but we may not articulate it. And sometimes by speaking it, we can process it and maybe deal with it a little bit better. So today we're gonna to talk about the diagnosis and the fact that it ignites massive change throughout our life. In fact, a magnitude of change that Bruce Feiler would refer to as a life quake. Now, this is from his book, Life is in the Transitions, and he defines a life quake as a massive change or a pileup of changes resulting in aftershocks for years. Now, Feiler recognizes that life is a continuous process of change. We go through countless changes over the course of a lifetime. But he said, statistically, we only go through four life quakes, and these have long-term consequences. You are shake, rattling, and rolling for years in the aftermath of a life quake. And so I think the diagnosis certainly falls under this definition. So no matter how much change you've incurred up until this point in time, I'm bringing you great news of joy, I know, there is more change ahead, which means there is more uncertainty ahead which also leads to the realization that's caregiving, isn't it? That's the nature of the journey that we are called to. 
And with all of this continuous change, it's hard to maintain our balance from hour to hour or day to day. And it's exhausting, isn't it? Now this actually has a name, it has a term, it's called change fatigue. And I think many of you, again, just by listening to snippets of your story, you might not have heard of this term, but you get it, you feel it, you've experienced it. Because when we're caring for someone with a progressive condition, just when you think you have found your sea legs, right? Just when you think that peace is in the valley, something else happens. Now that could be a decline or it could be an improvement, but either way, it's a change that you have to adapt to. So it can be wearing on the mind, the body and the spirit. So the journey of caregiving, it presents many challenges for all dimensions of our being. So that's physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and psychosocially. So have you ever felt like this climber during the day that everything is just straight uphill? I would imagine you have. But I think one of the most daunting challenges of this entire journey of serving as a care partner is the uncertain and unknown future. And so as you look forward into the days, weeks, or years ahead, Unless you're clairvoyant, and if you are, I'd love to chat with you. <laughs> Maybe we could go in on a lottery ticket or something. But as you're doing this, you know, you can't really see clearly into the future. It's kind of foggy. And I don't know about you, but I don't like the unknown. I don't like uncertainty. And that really is the nature of most human beings. You may love to read a mystery, but I don't think you like to live in mystery. And so that is a huge challenge. But if that is the nature of the journey that we're on as care partners, then it begs the question, well, well, what can we do about it? Can we resolve? Can we mitigate some of this fear? And what about that uncertainty? What inspires us to confront it, to beat it down, to tame it? Well, I always go back to my foundational belief that is knowledge is power. So if we're gonna deal with change and uncertainty, we need to understand the process and how it evolves, how it unfolds, and then how we can interact with that. So let's consider the nature of change. Now change by definition means something ends. The end of a relationship, the end of a job, the end of a way of life the end of good health. And when an ending occurs, endings generate a sense of loss. That is why we grieve after change. And also in the aftermath of change, we have this overwhelming sense of uncertainty because nothing's normal after a significant change. This isn't the world we have always known. And so we're looking forward thinking, okay, so now what? What's next? So change, by definition means there's an ending. With an ending, we experience loss and we are also thrown into a period of uncertainty. It's also important to recognize with change, a lot of people say, oh, I don't like change or I fear change. Well, in actuality, sometimes we don't even know change is about to happen. So how could we fear it? When my dad had a stroke in 1992, I wasn't fearing he was gonna have a stroke. There were no indications that was on the horizon, but I certainly feared the aftermath of his stroke. I feared the turbulence of transitions after that massive change. So it's the transitions that are problematic, not necessarily the change. Now at this point, perhaps an image or a metaphor or a picture of how this actually works might be beneficial. And as you might imagine, I love images because of the pictures you're seeing up on the screen. And I just happen to have a model to offer to you. And I call it bridge time. I wanna walk you through this process and it will help you understand where you are in your relationship to change and transition. And it will also help you to envision where you're going. So the story that goes along with this image of the bridge is that Imagine this morning you awakened and everything happened exactly as planned. 
first and foremost, savor that moment. <laughs> They're few and far between. So because of that, as you're cruising through life, your journey is very flat. The pathway is wide. There are no twists and turns. It's easy until you encounter that detour sign and you have to take a sharp right. And you're thinking, what is this all about? And you take a few strides and all of a sudden you hit a point of inflection, which is represented by the left side of the bridge. And the gradient of your path just became much steeper. Life became harder. And you're looking around thinking, what just happened? And then you hear this loud sound in front of you, roaring water. And you see this chasm opening up before you. And you look over the edge and you see the turbulent waters of transition. And you're thinking, my gosh, how am I going to move from one side of this chasm to another? And you raise your eyes and you see this lovely bridge before you. And you think, wow, this is opportune, isn't it? And then you start to skeptically and critically assess your situation and your options because this bridge is very narrow and you realize it's a one-way bridge. Once you enter it, you can't turn around. You can't go back. Now, how does that relate to change and transition? When change happens, we're on the left side of this bridge. We need to traverse the rough waters of transition. We need to move from what was to what will be. And yes, we have that transitional bridge, but we don't know exactly where we're headed, right? We don't know what that new normal is, that new beginning, and do we trust it? Do we walk on faith? Or do we cower in fear? Are we paralyzed at the opening of that bridge? Well, that's a choice. But if we choose to go across that bridge, also realize it's not a skip in the park. You're gonna be doing the hard work of grieving and mourning in the aftermath of change. Because remember, change is defined as an ending. And when we have an ending, we experience a loss. That is why we find change so difficult because grieving is one of the hardest things we do as human beings. But this model has helped me so much in my transitions and I hope that it will serve you well because it can give us hope. There is something beyond this moment after change. We are moving forward. We're learning to live with our loss and to embrace a new beginning. And that's important as a care partner because you will traverse many bridges in your journey. And just as you exit one, you feel like you're entering another. And some bridges are short, other bridges are long. And so it's not that you can eliminate bridges from your life. Because remember, life and caregiving are continuous processes of change and transition. And this is not just you, it's gonna be your entire family as well. Because remember, this is not a personal challenge, it's a family challenge. So it's going to affect all concerned. The diagnosis has a huge ripple effect and affects everyone to a greater and lesser extent depending on the relationship to the person who has the diagnosis. And that diagnosis is destabilizing for the entire family system. Everyone feels discombobulated because disease has now become an unwanted new member of your family. And everyone has to learn how to live with it, not dance around it like my family did. That did not serve us well. But everyone is going to have a different relationship to that diagnosis, learning how to deal with it, how to manage it, maybe even how to tame it. And that's because the disease, it upsets the balance, the tenuous balance of your family. Now, I don't know about you, but my family was not perfect. Is yours? <laughs> Most are not, and we need to recognize that. Over the course of a lifetime, we negotiate this tenuous balance in which we live. And in systems theory, it's called achieving homeostasis. So you have this balance that you learn to live and work and care together. And any little change in that family system in your life, it throws it off kilter. And so when that happens, when you have a significant diagnosis, then it changes the family rhythm. You don't move through your day in the same way. 
It demands a course correction oftentimes. You are not traveling toward the same end goal that you were before the diagnosis. And it requires a transformation of hopes and dreams. And as we noted, that new member of your family represents an ending. So you're gonna be grieving all that was lost in that moment, as well as anticipating all the future losses. So it's no wonder that this is a challenging journey and we long for what was. That's when we start looking back over our shoulder. Now, have any of you ever said, oh, I just wanna feel normal again? Boy, I have many times. I just wanna go back. But what we have to recognize is that there's no going back. Remember the bridge, it's a narrow entry. And once you're moving through, you can't make that U-turn. You have to consider what next, what now? So how do we navigate this journey? How do we go on to move through, to integrate loss into the fabric of our being, to deal with uncertainty and to move into that new normal? Well, we all must learn how to adapt, adjust and to accommodate to that massive change. And people in your family are gonna do that differently because everybody in your family system has a unique relationship to the person with the diagnosis. They have their own unique view of what's going on and they have their own unique personality on how they're going to cope. And sometimes that creates a rub in a family system because you're not all on the same page at the same time. And that's very true for the care partner and the care receiver, the person with the diagnosis. Emotionally and cognitively, you are not feeling or thinking about the diagnosis in the same way at the same time. And that can lead to some arguments. It can lead to some hurt feelings and it can also generate a lot of anger as well. So appreciate that transitioning, we all do it at a different pace, at our own speed. I've talked to many families recently and I recognized from the person that I was talking to that they were moving through their transition at a pretty methodical pace, but they were irritated, majorly irritated that some of their family members seemed to be dragging their feet. I want them to hurry up. You know, they need to catch up with me, get on the same page. And then this person was also majorly irritated that some members were way ahead of her. And she just wanted to pull them back and say, where do you think you're going? <laughs> How do you know you're headed in the right direction? Now, I say this somewhat with humor, but she really, she was just irritated to the core and it wasn't serving her well. She was wasting a lot of energy on that. So just honor the fact that everyone goes at their own pace at their own time based on their understanding of the situation. There are so many factors that influence our unique journey. So our age, when we hear this news, is this a child? Is this an older adult? What's the relationship to the person that has the diagnosis? What are the hopes and fears of that person? Do they have a previous experience of companioning someone with a significant diagnosis? And what's their understanding of the disease process? That's all going to influence how well or if they're transitioning. So be gentle with yourself and be gentle with the person you're caring for and be gentle with your other family members and friends. Sometimes they're just doing the best they can. And with a little kindness and compassion, you can avoid destroying relationships and you can continue to walk this path together because the goal is teamwork. We know that in a family system, the biggest challenge over the course of a lifetime is a change in health of any one member of that family system. So know after the diagnosis, you need your family. We need each other. That's the nature of being human. We are inherently gregarious creatures. We want and need each other. And as we are caring for someone in our family, there are gonna be days you need somebody to lean on. There are gonna be other days that people are gonna lean on you. And that's a mutually beneficial relationship, interdependence. 
That's what's going to keep you going when the times are tough. And it will also help to avoid the situation of feeling lonely and alone. Now, loneliness is a very difficult aspect of caring for another person, whether you're the care partner or you are the care recipient, because oftentimes our world becomes very small when we start focusing on the diagnosis and the, and the, the disease. We don't have time for social obligations. We don't have time to nurture friendships. And things just kind of fade away without even noticing it until sometimes it's almost too late to reconnect. But if you count on your family, you realize that you don't have to do this by yourself, you can avoid that situation of chronic loneliness. So together we are better. So let's shift and appreciate how family systems are affected by the diagnosis by looking at the inner workings of family. This is important so you have realistic expectations of how family will or should respond. Again, naming the audience, or the obvious, all families are dysfunctional at some level. I mean, that should be our expectation. And in the aftermath of a life quake, we're not on our best game. We're hurt, we're scared, we're emotionally raw, we don't know exactly what's going on, we are not at our prime. And so it shouldn't surprise us that there are gonna be some mishaps, some missteps, some mistakes along the way. So we need to cut each other a little bit of slack. So families are complex systems, the understatement of the day. And if you're interested in family systems theory, it actually might serve you well, although I doubt you have time to dive into a lot of text on this. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of an overview about this. Let's look at what the system components are that are tested by the diagnosis. First, roles, rules, and responsibilities. Those are the things we rely on to keep equilibrium in the family so that everything moves swimmingly. Well, you interject the disease process and all bets are off. Everything changes. Roles change, responsibilities change, and rules change. So consider the roles that are represented in your own family. I would imagine there is the quintessential caregiver. That's probably you. <laughs> there is the decision maker, the spiritual leader, the leader of the band overall, the clown, the communicator, the wild child, the disenfranchised person, the weird aunt or uncle, whatever it might be. But everybody has their own role, right? So think about this. The person who receives the diagnosis, what role had they typically been serving in? What were their responsibilities? And what happens when they're no longer able to fulfill that role? Who will take that role over? Who will assume those responsibilities? Will it be a turf war? Will there be a battle? Will people say, ooh, I don't wanna do that. So there'll be an absence in your family. Well, depending on the role that they served, it could be very disruptive. If the person who is ill used to be the decision maker, now everybody's muddling around trying to figure out what to do. So this is a huge destabilizing event for the family system. Also, the rules of engagement have changed. So you may have to renegotiate personal boundaries. Now, boundaries are vitally important. You need to know where you end and the other person begins. And that little buffer between the two, that's your zone of mutual respect. So I don't wanna tread on your toes, I don't want you treading on mine. So I have to renegotiate what we expect from each other in light of this new family member, the disease. Now, a lot of people are not very good at boundaries, but they are so critically important in this journey of caregiving. So it's worth having the conversation and reestablishing healthy boundaries and you're gonna to have to revisit those from time to time at, as things continue to change. Now, how many of you think you communicate incredibly well with your family members? <laughs> Communication's tough, even on a good day, right? And so when we're under a lot of pressure, again, when we're dealing with a crisis situation, when we have a new list of things we have to do every day, sometimes we just forget to tell someone something. And when we're in the midst of caregiving, sometimes that hurts our feelings. 
hey, nobody told me that. Why didn't you give me an update on mom or dad? And so a lot of hurt feelings come to the forefront and people get angry and then they start to distance from each other and lines of communication go down. So if you happen to offend someone, make your apologies, clean up the mess as soon as you can, because again, you need everybody on board and you need to have open lines of communication so that you're all working toward the same goal, you're supporting each other, you're caring for each other, and you're not getting wrapped around the axle about some tiny little offense. Just sometimes we just have to let those things go. Also recognize that your beliefs probably have been and will be tested with this new member in your family, the disease. And maybe the God that you've always worshiped, whatever you deem to be sacred, has not lived up to your expectations. And so you start to doubt. Now, if one person in a family starts to doubt their foundational beliefs, it shakes everybody else in that family up because they start looking and thinking, well, wow, if Jane's questioning her faith, well, maybe, maybe I'm not too certain about what I believe now. And again, this is where we need to talk. We need to articulate that doubt and that fear. This is, this is the human nature. It's not bad to question. So don't blame anyone that may feel a little bit uncertain about their faith. Encourage them to work on it, maybe to seek some pastoral counseling and reconnect and reimagine that relationship with the divine that will serve them so well in the long run. So what's the message about family? Have realistic expectations. Do not expect perfection and cut yourself a little bit of slack as well. You do not have to be perfect either. So one step at a time, work together to establish common goals and a common plan of care. One step at a time, you're gonna make it through that transition. Now let's shift and talk about the emotional aspect of the journey of caregiving. Now, it, needless to say, it is emotional. In fact, there are some days, it just feels like you've been put into an emotional blender, right? You felt every emotion known to man or woman in a matter of 30 minutes because of things that are going on in your world. And I'm not saying that's necessarily bad, but it can be very distressing if you don't understand where those emotions are coming from and then you do nothing to process them. Now, some of the emotions I'm gonna flip through here, I bet you're gonna to relate to. I would imagine there are days when you feel dazed and confused, others where you're shocked and amazed. Then you will rise to the occasion and you will feel braver and bolder than you ever imagined. You were courageous. Then you're surprised, afraid, bereft, joyful, anxious, resistant. I relate to this one. Skeptical, confrontational, ready to do a little bit of battle, irritated to the point of anger and rage, hopeful, Devastated, confident, and some days we just feel relieved. Now we could add to those as well, but the point being the wheel of emotion, it spins non-stop some days as a care partner. And the goal is not to ignore your emotions, it's to learn how to deal with them effectively knowing how to handle your emotions and the emotions of others as well. This is the key to emotional health. Now, emotional health is defined as your awareness of your emotions and the ability to accept them, to manage them, and then to express them in an appropriate way, not in a destructive manner. And good emotional health doesn't protect you from tough situations or tough feelings. Instead, it helps you handle them with a clear vision. This is all about what is referred to as emotional agility, which been a, has been a hot topic of conversation in academia for about the past 10 years. 
This is the idea that states, it isn't to have more positive emotions and to try to be merry sunshine, and it's not about stopping negative emotions. Rather, the goal is to make use, to make use of whatever emotions you have. By accepting your emotions rather than trying to change them, you can make good use of them. All of our emotions tell us something. It's our reaction to what's going on in the world around us. And sometimes we need to respond to that, not to stuff it, not to discount it, not to think, well, I don't know how to deal with that today. So for emotional health to serve you well for the long term, so you can go the distance, my word of wisdom is this, which a caregiver told me many years ago, feel what you feel when you feel it. Own it, honor it, understand it, and also respect the emotions of others. It goes a long way to moving you forward in this journey of life. Now we've covered a lot of ground thus far. We've talked about the reality of what a change the diagnosis is, not only for you, not only for the person with the disease, but your entire family system. We've noted this is an emotional journey as well. Now I wanna give you some ideas on how to keep going. How can you go the distance? And I just happen to have three R's to share with you. These are the guiding lights that I've used for decades. And again, they're not strictly my idea. I have learned from the best. But I wanna share with you how resilience, response, and ritual can help you as a care partner. So let's begin by looking at resilience. When we are challenged by life, any kind of massive change, but certainly a change in health in the family, you gotta have bounce if you are gonna move from one side of that transitional bridge to the other. And by bounce, I mean resilience. This is a process of adapting well in the face of adversity. It means bouncing back from difficult experiences. Now it's not a genetic trait, it's a process, which means we can learn it. And it also means we can reinforce it. We can grow in our ability to bounce back. Now, if you're interested in this topic of resilience, I highly recommend the work of Stephen Southwick. It's noted in your bibliography in the handout. But he has teased out, predicated on years of research and hundreds if not thousands of interviews with people, he's teased out what he calls the key ingredients to bounce back. And I'm just gonna share with you a few of them. Now, I would imagine many of you rely on these ingredients already but maybe I will offer you an idea you haven't considered. So the first ingredient and fundamental to bouncing back is being optimistic. Optimism is the spark that ignites resilience. And again, I'm not talking about rose-colored glasses, pie-in-the-sky attitude, humming kumbaya in the corner and thinking all will be well. That is not gonna serve you when times are tough but realistic optimism will. Recognize your situation, understand the reality, and have the ability to look to the future and see a glimmer of hope on the horizon. Just one glimmer is sometimes all we need to keep going. The second ingredient is courage. Courage to confront our fear, oftentimes about the unknown and the uncertain. If we're not able to do this, Fear becomes our greatest disability. We are then paralyzed by our situation. A third ingredient is making sure that you have a supportive community. Remember, we need each other. We are better together, whether that's family, extended family, friends, or professionals. We are better together. This is a key component to resilience. Resilient role models can also inspire us to bounce back. So just reflect on the people that you know in your own life. Maybe your parents, your grandparents, your spouse, your partner, a sibling, a friend, even a public figure. Someone who has been tested mightily by life, but they have chosen to bounce back. They have risen to the occasion and they flourished in the aftermath of adversity instead of withering because of circumstances. Maybe you can choose to emulate them Maybe you can discern how they did that and you can reenact that process in your own life. We also must be willing 
to adapt to changing circumstances. Now, I know there's a tendency when life takes a turn that we don't like to stand stiff and upright in the winds of change and take on that self-righteous attitude that this is not fair. This is not what I asked for. And that typically will not serve us well because we risk being shattered and broken by life. We are much better served to bend with the winds of change, to adapt and to accommodate that. And you gotta keep your humor, right? You gotta laugh from time to time. In fact, humor is one of our best methods of coping as human beings. And it moves the energy around, the stress and the strain. It gives us a little bit of a break. It generates endorphins and serotonins internally that serve us well. But it can totally change our perspective on the situation. We're not laughing at our circumstances, but despite them. And certainly knowing your why is vitally important. Having a sense of meaning and purpose, knowing you have a reason to be, can keep you going through the trials of life. That was the premise of the work of Viktor Frankl, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning. This is his memoir of being imprisoned in Auschwitz for three and a half years. And he concluded, if you could discern meaning in the midst of suffering and adversity, suffering ceased to be suffering. He echoed the sentiment of Friedrich Nietzsche, an existential philosopher of the 19th century, who stated, he or she, we will update it a little bit, who has a why to live can bear with almost any how. If you have a sense that there's a reason you are here, you can tolerate about anything. And that why extends beyond the particular moment of change and loss to incorporate the entirety of your existence, what Frankel referred to as the ultimate why of your life. And finally, foundational faith is a key component to resilience. That pillar that you lean against, the beliefs that you trust, that will guide you through the dark nights of the soul. Faith is a place of mystery where we find the courage to believe what we cannot see and the strength to let go of our fear of uncertainty. So the bottom line regarding resilience for me is this. Transformational resilience provides the framework and skills that enable us to use adversity, to use change, and to use life's challenges as opportunities for innovation, creativity, growth, and transformation. This is a total reframe of a life quake. It's not just a challenge, it's not just devastating, but it can be ultimately an opportunity. And that is what I refer to as the afterglow of adversity. Now the second R I wanna share with you has to do with our response to life. Now when, when we have the diagnosis, when we have that massive change, we have a choice. How do we choose to respond to that? How do we choose to respond during the times of transition? Well, attitude is everything. Amma Marston notes in her book, Type R, that although we may not be able to control our external circumstances, what happens to us in life, one of the magnificent things about human beings that we can always choose our attitudes and our attitudes inform our response. So we need not be victims of life. We need not be victimized by our circumstances. We have the ability to choose a response. So consider through all the twists and turns of your journey up until this point in time, how have you typically responded and has it served you well? Well, only you can answer that, but the choice is yours and it's a critical choice that you'll make because from that day forward, it determines the trajectory of your life for better or for worse. So may we all choose wisely. Now the last R I wanna share with you may be something you hadn't actually considered before, and that is the R of ritual. I think this is a profoundly important guiding light. And I stress it because my generation, the boomers, we were known to disparage the benefits of ritual. <laughs> 
we've actually been referred to as the ritual light generation. So ritual is not routine. It is not rote. It is not just going through the motions. Instead, rituals are intentional and meaningful. Rituals make a difference and they can make a profound difference during a time in which everything is abnormal, chaotic, and not familiar. I wanna share with you a definition from Thomas More, who says that ritual is any action that speaks to the soul and to the deep imagination. Even the smallest rites of everyday existence are important to the soul. Now, isn't that lovely? But what does it mean? Is he talking about religious, spiritual? Well, he's talking about all of those things and secular as well. So I wanna give you a quick little story to distinguish ritual from routine. So every day I want to have a cup of tea to start my day, hot tea. So I go to my kitchen, boil water, throw the tea bag in, drink it, get caffeine into this, bill, into this body. That's my goal, that's routine. But then about once a quarter, I engage in ritual. So I create a very special pot of hot tea. I go in the kitchen and I pull down a special china teapot, a special china tea cup, and I will only brew constant comment tea because that was my mother's favorite. And as I'm brewing that pot of tea and I smell the characteristic oranges and spices, I am transported back in time to my childhood home. And I'm sitting across the breakfast table from my mom and we're talking about life. We did that every day when I was growing up. Now I do this when I have the need to connect to my mother, when I need that sense of belonging and of home and of groundedness and certainty. That is the beauty of ritual. We need this so desperately because ritual frames ordinary time as extraordinary time. And it connects us to that which is beyond ourselves, other people, other memories, maybe to the sense of the divine and the sacred. And it satisfies our hunger for the familiar. Because if we've engaged in this ritual before, we know how to do it. We could do it with our eyes closed. And that brings to us predictability, order, and continuity. And these are the things we long for when life is chaotic and uncertain. These are the things you need during times of change and transition. So if you don't engage in ritual today, create a ritual this evening or tomorrow and do it every day. So a few parting notes before we go. If you're feeling overwhelmed, just know you're not alone. We all have those moments. And when that happens, Choose to hang on to hope. Choose to respond in life-giving ways. And choose to go the distance. So I usually do a heartfelt closing ritual. Do we have time? Do a quick little reading here. As if I haven't babbled enough, right? I wanna to close today by sharing something with you that I wrote several years ago. It's the conclusion to my book, Caregiving for the Genius. And it's a caregiving benediction. And it's my hope and fervent prayer for all of us. I'm speaking to you as well as to myself. A benediction is a short invocation in which we ask for help, blessings, and guidance. Therefore, there is no better way to conclude our conversation about the journey of caregiving than with a benediction. We need all the help we can get as we care for each other. So as the caregiving journey unfolds one step at a time, may we all be blessed in the following ways. May we have the courage to care for each other. May we feel companioned in the caregiving journey. May we have the wisdom to prepare to care. May we have sustaining faith to confront our fears. May we graciously offer and receive help. May we discover strength unimagined during times of loss. May we remain hopeful during times of trial. May we recognize the sacred in the ordinary. May we engage the journey one step at a time. May we be grateful for the moment and may we humbly answer the call to care. 
May we listen well, love deeply, and live fully all the way to the end of the road. May it be so. So I wanna thank you for the opportunity to share a bit of the journey with you. Just know that I wish you many blessings and if I can ever be of help to you, my contact information is included in your handout. I would love to continue the conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. You can see why we were very excited to get her as our keynote speaker. She is fabulous. Um, I'm happy that she will be here for the entire day because we're probably gonna have to cut questions a little short. Um, so does anybody in the audience have a question? All right. Oh, sure. And I obviously didn't master the double click, right? <laughs> I wanna test your uh, experience of working with caregivers over the years. Can you hear me all right? Okay, it gets to the matter of purpose, some of the existential aspects uh, you were quoting. What are the positive benefits that you've observed that go with being a caregiver for relationships, particularly for family, family relationships? Well, I have, this is a discussion that I have with a lot of families because oftentimes when I meet them, they're in distress and they can't see anything good about the journey of caregiving. So I'm very sensitive to the timing of the message to say there are blessings in this journey. There are things that can be learned. We can grow from it, but oftentimes we don't realize that until years after the fact. So you have to be very sensitive to when you deliver that message. But I know from my own personal experience as a caregiver and talking to others, people have deepened their relationship with the person they've cared for. They learned a new dimension of that person that was never revealed to them before. So that was vitally important to them. They recognized they had the capacity to care at a level unrealized in times past. They also strengthened their own relationship with their sense of the sacred because they relied so incredibly much on their faith during that journey. And it also has resulted in new friendships and a support system, meeting other people that were going through a similar journey at the same time. And so sharing their stories with these initially strangers in a support group or meeting someone at a conference, then their network of support expanded that served to care for them after the caregiving journey was over. So those are just a few of the things that come to mind. You're nodding your head, so I don't know if, you, if you've experienced that as well. Any other questions? Okay. Are there any other questions? When you talk about, when you talk about meaning as being important, um, how how do you help your partner who is in the advanced stages of a disease find meaning in their life with Parkinson's? Um, a lot of sleeping, a lot of uh, not being present, an inability to do everyday things. How do you support a partner in that situation? That's very difficult because that's a huge transition in how that person understands themselves and how they can be a presence in the world. And so we derive meaning in a variety of ways by what we offer, what we can contribute, and Oftentimes that's through the work that we do. We also discern meaning in life by what is done to us, how people interact with us. And actually Viktor Frankl says, the greatest source of meaning is how we choose to deal with suffering in our life. Now it's not the easiest way to learn, but it's probably the most profound way. So when I talk to people, and I've talked to many, even some family members who have told me, I'm done. I don't know why I'm still here. 
I have nothing to offer every day. I try to go to the roots of who they are, not what they can do. And to also reinforce the fact that their story matters. So sometimes that part of the journey of any disease process is a time to capture the stories, to sit with family and to say, remember when, or these are the things I learned that matter the most. This is all about creating an ethical will, which I think is the most valuable part of our legacy. And we can do that orally, we can write it down, we can have someone record it, we can videotape it. But I think just looking at someone to say that you are here and you have made a difference in the world, that you matter until your very last breath. And I wanna know more about the journey that you took. I want you to share those stories. Sometimes we just need people to value that and to proclaim it to say, wow, I do have a reason to wake up tomorrow.